All right, I would like to welcome everybody for coming tonight and welcome Dr. Quaid, thank you for coming. Um, so just a little introduction before we get going. Dr. Quaid has founded VUE Cubed Vision Therapy Clinics out of his passion for visual rehabilitation, um, having suffered some uh, consequences of severe uh, traumatic brain injury at the age of eight years old. He knows firsthand what it can do uh, to the academic potential of a child. So. Dr. Quaid currently um, is a professor at the University of Waterloo, uh, their School of Opto Optometry, um, as well as the pre president of the College of Optometrists of Ontario. Um, Dr. Quaid has several peer reviewed scientific publications for optometry as well as medical journals, um, highlighting the fact that he is a co-author for a medical book um, on dis visual dysfunction in concussions. The title of that book is called Neurosensory Disorders in Traumatic Brain Injury. So in addition to all of this training, um, uh, in addition to his training, sorry, um, as an optometrist in the UK, mainly uh, within the NSHS hospital eye care system, Dr. Quaid attained his PhD in vision science in 2006, as well as a postdoctoral year in 2007 from the University of Waterloo as well. Um, so, Dr. Quaid has delivered over 750 lectures worldwide um, to optometrists, physicians, educators, allied um, healthcare professionals on visual dysfunction in pediatric, as well as adult concussion cases um, on the topic of vision-based learning uh, dif dif oh, difficulties. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, in um, mid-2020, um, Dr. Quaid has uh, wrote a book uh, directed at parents and teachers of these children with learning disabilities. Um, the book is titled Learning to See and Seeing to Learn. Um, Dr. Quaid makes a point of showcasing uh, videos to show how he can often make immediately immediate and significant changes to the cases by realizing how powerful the visual system really is. Um, so welcome Dr. Quaid. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay clear? Th thumbs up? Yeah, you can hear me. Perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do a share screen here. Um, I'm going to make sure to share a sound because I always forget that part. There we go. So let's just go to the lecture here for a moment. And let me pull up this. So this, um, so the title of the talk today, I'm going to try to keep it high level, relevant, and not get lost in detail. Um, there's nothing worse than having to listen to a talk in head. But I, I think what, what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about how vision can impact uh, your ability to function and how we need to kind of go beyond 2020, because we all hear that term, right? You know, my, my eyesight's perfect, I see 2020. And, and unfortunately, all 2020 means is I can see size 20 font 20 feet away. So when you actually look at um, the eye chart that you see in the doctor's office, um, you barely have to move your eyes at 20 feet to read a line of letter. So the eye movements required are fairly minimal. So that's something I really wanna ram home. But I think from a, sorry, I just got a little, um, I've, got, I've got a box right in front of me of people that I'm trying to minimize here. So bear with me for a second here. Let's see if I can shrink it down. Just give me one second here. Just bear with me here. I just wanna shrink that down. There we go. So getting into the talk, um, I like to show this slide because a lot of people will look at this slide and go, geez, you know, is this guy trying to compensate for something? <laughs> um, and, and the reason why I show that is I, I like to contrast that with another fact, which is 100% true. I was told I'd be lucky to finish high school twice. So I, I had a pretty bad um, motor vehicle accident when I was about nine years old. Um, I was knocked out of commission probably for about three years. Um, so I've, I've experienced all the symptoms of TBI, the light sensitivity, the sensitivity to peripheral awareness, uh, difficulty with crowds, um, all those symptoms, believe me, I think, I think that's having gone through that for good or for bad, I think was worth 10 PhDs because you can relate to what the patient's telling you. And I wouldn't be much of an Irishman unless I actually quoted Yates. So <laughs> education is not the filling of the pail, but the lighting of a fire. So translated means education means nothing unless you can, unless you can use it to change people's lives for the better. Um, so I don't know if my PhD supervisor was trying to scare me, but the first day of my doctoral thesis, he shows me this picture and says, these are all the different centers in the brain, Pat. Every single part uh, serves a different function for vision. And I remember looking at this thinking, wow, and we just use an eye chart to assess it. How dumb is that? Um, 
here's a research paper from the early 90s that shows basically about 40% of the human brain. So at least 40%, so probably closer to half. So about half your brain is primarily for vision. It's the largest sensory system in, in, in the human body by far. And if you look at an MRI of somebody reading, um, you can actually see, the, if you look at the eyes going from side to side, you can actually see the optic nerve at the back of the eyeball moves. And it's, it's like the optic nerve doesn't look like brain tissue. It is brain tissue. So you could argue, really, the eyes are the only part of the brain that moves. It's a very different way to think of, think of your eyes. Now, I'm going to show you something called the McGurk effect. And hopefully this works on your screens at home. Um, the sound is on, so that should work. So what the McGurk effect is, it's demonstrating that when hearing and vision collide and they mismatch, vision wins, okay? So what you'll see is a guy is going to pop up and he's going to say the word ba. So the sound will never change. It will always be ba with a B. But depending on how you see his mouth move, you will perceive hearing either ba or something else. So I'll show you the clip and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Ba, ba, ba. Have ba, a look at this. Ba, what do you ba. hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what ba, happens ba, when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, ba, the sound ba. hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a b. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. Pretty cool, right? So what that shows is we, we use different parts of the brain for different things, but what happens when there's sensory conflict? Basically, vision says, I'm taking over, right? Now, we're going to bring that into um, other things that we're going to talk about in concussion. Um, and if some of you joined us, um, there was somebody on the call whose background, there was a ceiling fan turning and that was no critique to the person. I was pointing out why that was bothering some people, right? It's clearly a visual thing. So we actually need a total of 17 visual skills to function. So here they are. And when we talk about like, and I'm not going to go through each one, but it's basically near far focusing, death perception, color perception. But when you talk about the, the eye chart that you, that is used to assess you in the doctor's office. That's one of those skills, right? So you have that little skill there. So to me, what's really odd about that, when you look at the research, um, your ability to see size 20 font 20 feet away is actually the least predictive of function of all of the 17 factors. Yet that is the central component of the routine eye exam. Now, to be clear, there's nothing wrong with doing a routine eye exam. It's perfectly fine for a routine patient. Um, but if you have a concussion patient, a brain injury patient, or a child with a learning disability, which is another group of people that we see in the clinic, you, you really have to go way beyond acuity, okay? Um, so this little clip next is interesting because this is, um, I videotaped one of my colleagues. So one of the other doctors in the office, because we have three. We have an office in Guelph and in North York. Um, and our, our, our view clinics are, we're not, we don't do any routine eye care. We're not a routine eye exam place. We don't sell glasses. Literally all we do is rehabilitation. We eat, breathe, and sleep it. And what's interesting is when, when I decided to record my colleague reading the 2020 line. So remember the 2020 line typically has about five letters that are quite small. And they're usually about this far apart at 20 feet, right? So if you record his eyes, so what I did is I, I recorded his eyes up close while he was reading the 2020 line. Now watch his eyes and tell me, do you see his eyes moving? So he blinks towards the end, but watch his eyes. Do you see them move? Okay, so if you can read the 2020 line for me there. O-R-U-F-A. So he blinked towards the end, but didn't really see a whole lot of movement, right? So I'll show you that to you once more. Let's go back, play it again. Okay, so if you can read the 2020 line for me there. 
O R U F A. Not a whole lot of movement, right? Now, if we get him to read, so if we record his eyes and if he reads in his head or close, watch his eyes. So if you can read the first paragraph for me in your head. Clearly, very obvious that his eyes are moving, right? So if you look at that and, and what's the simple takeaway from that slide? Does 2020 tell me anything about how the eyes move? Well, the answer is no. So why is it the standard? What do I have to do when I read? Move my eyes. What do I have to do when I drive? Move my eyes. What do I have to do if I'm walking up and down the stairs? Move my eyes. What do I have to do if I'm in a grocery store or a mall and there's 20 people in my periphery and they're all moving? Move my eyes. What do most concussion patients complain about? Things connected to eye movements. So we do a really silly thing and we only measure 2020, and then we tell the patient there's nothing wrong with them when we haven't actually assessed eye movements properly, right? So you see the big disconnect there. So we've missed a fundamental fact that 2020 literally tells you nothing about how the eyes move. So we actually published a paper on this and we, we looked at uh, patients using something called a visograph, which is a goggle, which is kind of cool. There's four, those four little white boxes on the bottom, they're infrared cameras. So you put the goggle on, you get the person to read, and you can actually see what their eyes are doing on the page in real time. So this is somebody reading without a problem, right? So their tracking is going along because again, most patients who have eye teaming issues have a heck of a time reading. They can never remember what they've read. They, they lose their place all the time. Um, and after a while, they just stop reading. They listen to audiobooks or podcasts. And what you see here is uh, this instrument also gives us the ability to see how many times they move their eyes to read. So this person uh, moved his eyes 96 times to read 100 words three regressions. So that means they went back occasionally to double check things, three regressions per hundred words. So that's fine. We all do that occasionally. And at the very bottom, you see cross correlation. That's the amount of time that that's the, that's a percentage of the time that the eyes track together on the page. This is somebody with an eye teaming issue. So I'll show you the stats in a minute, but just look at the tracking pattern. So you see the way that person's going back and forth, a lot of regressions jumping all over the place. You look at the stats, 448 eye movements to read 100 words. So it's physically exhausting. Uh, 145 regression. So they're going back and double checking a lot. And that's only a drop in 15%. So the cross correlation is still 85%. So if on top of that, my tracking is off, but now, and that's not your screen going weird, that print is coming in and out of focus. So imagine that your focusing is coming in and out of focus, plus your tracking is off. What do you think that's going to do to your comprehension? I'm trying to read something for understanding. I get through three or four paragraphs and I literally have no idea what I just read, right? So the analogy I often use with parents to, to really try to get this across to parents because the adults can often articulate what's going on or they'll, they, they'll at least tell you reading is difficult, right? How do you deal with this with an eight-year-old kid? Because an eight-year-old kid will often not complain, especially if this has been their vision for a long time. Because guess what? As shocking as it sounds, they actually don't know what normal is. So they have nothing to compare it to. So what we often show the parents is I often get the parents who don't have the problem. I kind of get the parent to read something for me. And I say, I want you to read this. And they'll go, Bobby the bear loves to read. And as they're reading, I'll start to mess with the print. And I'll still, I'll actually force the parent to read the whole thing. So when they get to the end, I'll, I'll kind of turn off uh, the slide. And I'll say, so what did you read? And they'll look at me and go, I have no idea. Like, what are you seeing in your child? Exactly the same thing. So that can often be a very good educational tool for the parents, because often the parents will default to, you know, my kid's not trying hard enough. They just need to try harder. Uh, they need to pay more attention. They're, you know, they're, there's all sorts of other reasons. And, and on that point of symptoms, um, this is actually the DSM-5. So these are the diagnostic criteria for attention deficit disorder. Now, here's the problem. Um, is ADHD a real thing? Of course it is. But look at the symptoms. The problem is, ADHD is a diagnosis of exclusion. In other words, if you look at the DSM-5, the manual that the psychologist and, psych and psychiatrist will use to diagnose this, the opening sentence says, in the absence of other neurosensory disorders, the following symptoms apply. So what that means is you have to be sure there's not something else causing the symptoms, and then you can default to an ADHD diagnosis. So if you look at this list, if you get six symptoms from the top part and six from the bottom, that will trigger a diagnosis of ADHD. So here's the problem. I'm gonna show you uh, another two columns. The middle column is all of the symptoms that you will get if your eyes are not teaming together. And all the symptoms on the right are what a normal healthy child under the age of seven years old will do. <laughs> so you can see the problem. 
problem is there's a lot of overlap and, and we see a lot of these types of symptoms in our adult concussion cases also where the patient will say i i cannot concentrate when i'm looking at a screen if I, especially if i scroll again motion um that really drives a lot of my concussion patients nuts so it's more the motion component so um, this is actually some, some research papers, which I've put in, I won't spend a lot of time on it. I know I'm not doing a lecture to university, but I do like to give the evidence if, if people want to go back over the slides and see it. But this is a, a publication that came out of the department of psychology and optometry. So it's kind of nice because David Bieberdorf is, a, is an optometrist and D D Dmitry Potowski is a psychologist. So if you look at this, what, what did they do? They, they took a whole bunch of patients who didn't have concussions and a whole bunch of patients that did. And they, they said, okay, if we just test their eye teaming, um, the ones that have deficient eye teaming, how much more likely are they to be from the concussion group as opposed to the control group? And the answer they came out with was nearly 11 times more likely, 10.72. So what that means is if your eyes don't team together properly, you are nearly 11 times more likely to be from a concussion group as opposed to a control group. That's a pretty strong, strong stat. Uh, this was published uh, by Pediatrics. This was CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I believe. Uh, and what these guys found, they took a bunch of kids age 11 to 17 who had concussions, and they looked at three eye-teaming problems. So the first was called convergence insufficiency, which is a fancy way for saying, I can't move my eyes towards my nose without getting symptoms or seeing double. Saccadic tracking, which is just tra tracking ability. And then accommodation, which is my ability to focus from far to near, far to near. And what they actually found, it's better if you show it in a picture, is 69 out of 100 patients had at least one of the three areas being deficient. 69 out of 100. Uh, 14 out of 100 had all three areas deficient. So you see the 14 in the middle of the three circles. So the bottom line is, if you, if you have a concussion, you have about a 69% chance of having one of those three eye-teaming problems. And there's more than three types of eye teaming problems. So in other words, it's common. If you have a cushion, it's not unusual. This is a paper that we published with the University of Toronto, sports medicine. And what we found, we took a whole bunch of patients who were playing varsity level sports, who were supposedly healthy, who've had concussions and were cleared to play. And we found on our baseline testing, anywhere between 16 to 18%, so almost one in five of the athletes who was playing had enough visual problems that they very likely should not have been playing. So chances are these people have had hits, they're continuing to play because they're not really aware that they actually have a problem or they are and they're either ignoring it or they're attributing it to something other than a concussive event that they've had. These obviously are all the symptoms that we tend to see in these cases. Um, you know, there's the cost of the problem. Um, the big thing that nobody really talks about is if 100 people have a concussion, about 15 out of 100 will have lingering symptoms after a month to two months. And we term those patients post-concussion syndrome patients. So those are the ones that we're talking about here. So these are the patients that will have persistent symptoms like I have a headache, difficulty concentrating, I'm light sensitive, I see blurry, I can't handle peripheral motion. These are all the symptoms that you tend to hear. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is, I'm gonna talk about peripheral vision versus central vision. And I want to be clear about the difference. So central vision is what you use when you point your eyes at something and you read the letters off an eye chart or you read a license plate off of a car. That's your central vision. That only occupies about 6% of your visual field. So in the center, and it's very easy to prove that because if you look at something around you and you look directly at it and you say, okay, what I'm looking at is clear, but without moving your eyes, you'll realize your peripheral vision is actually quite blurry, but you're aware of where things are, right? So I wanna talk about two systems. One is your motion system, and that's huge. I mean, if I put my hands behind my head and I wiggle my fingers, I can detect my fingers right about here, like pretty far out. But if I look at my detail system, I'm looking at a word in the center of my screen and as far away as just off, maybe an inch or two away from where I'm looking, the words are, are already blurred unless I move my eye to the new word, right? So I'm gonna use the term central and peripheral. So central vision, is really about detail. Peripheral vision is really about motion perception, where things are relative to me and where I am relative to things, right? So think about, um, I'm walking around in a, in a grocery store like a Walmart or a Costco. Um, you know, there's 20, 20 people moving in my periphery. That's, ap that's nothing to do with how well I read the eye chart, right? So this is, um, the picture I'm gonna show you is kind of one of, it's, it's, it's one of those fun houses. You know, uh, this is actually at the base of Niagara Falls. So it's the Ripley's, believe it or not, when you walk through a tunnel, 
it's rotating. Now, I, I would in real life, I would never put a, a concussion patient through this. This would be paramount to torture, right? So you walk through a tunnel, and as you're walking, the tunnel kind of rotates as you're walking through the tunnel. Now, the tunnel doesn't move, but the tunnel is rotating. And what you'll find in these types of environments, so this is somebody without a concussion. So she's walking. The tunnel is very slowly rotating clockwise. Watch which way she falls. She falls in the same direction as the motion. If you reverse the motion, she falls the other way. Interesting. So if I look at this and say, well, that's the periphery. That's the central part that you use for acuity. So, so which one? Uh, sorry, someone's got their sound on in the background, if you can mute. Um, so something is um, causing her to fall, right? So which one? Well, is it that central small blue area or is it the big massive green area, right? The only thing that was moving was her periphery. The floor was perfectly stable. So if we take that philosophy and we say, okay, how, how do I put that into a model? Maybe I'm just Irish, but I like things to be simple, how I was raised. Um, if I can explain it in a model, I can explain any case that walks in my door. So I always think of this kind of like a three-legged stool. If you take away one leg, the stool falls. So on the top, you have your visual system. So my central and my periphery. On the, on the bottom left, you have your vestibular system. So balance through my inner ear function. And then the other leg of the three-legged stool is what we call proprioception. So this is my, my feet are physically connected to the floor. So I'm proprioceptively grounded, right? All of those three should be saying the same thing at the same time. So what did the rotating tunnel prove? What did the funny tunnel prove? Well, when I'm walking through the tunnel, and, I, and I've done it in Niagara Falls, by the way, I went through it about 15 times until I felt like I was going to puke. And then my wife's like, yeah, better stop. So I'm walking through and I get this real nausea in my stomach as I'm walking through the tunnels rotating. I, I really feel like crap. And I close my eyes. I stop and I close my eyes and the, the feeling of nausea instantly disappears. And I, when I say instant, I mean like, like, like somebody turned on a tap, right? So what's really interesting, what's happening? When my eyes are closed, I'm only using vestibular and proprioception. And I have no symptoms. Why? Because my ears are saying, Patrick, you're not falling. My feet are saying, Patrick, you're not falling. And they agree. There's no sensory conflict. However, when I open my eyes, what's moving? Center or periphery? Periphery. That's moving. And now what happens? My whole body starts to go. So what did that prove? Even if these two systems are working properly, vision is so dominant. And I understand there's other areas. So I'm not, I'm not saying vision is the only thing because I don't just live in my own, my, my own silo. But based on what we just saw, vestibular and proprioception, even if they're working properly, can be overridden by vision, specifically peripheral vision, right? So my question is, okay, what if your peripheral visual system is malfunctioning? If it's that dominant... Isn't it potentially going, if you excuse my French, isn't it going to screw up the other two systems? Yeah, and that's typically what we see. So I'm going to show you uh, a couple of clips here. So the first one, um, let me just press pause here. So this is actually a patient in our clinic, and, and Kyle has given us full permission to show this in, in lectures to um, other patients, the public. He's, he's very um, wanting to get the message out there. So uh, MVA patient, he's in, he's in a car accident. He's walking. I'm going to get him to walk on the line. And you see, I'm holding his cane. He's a tall dude. Makes me look short. And I am short, but he makes me look real short. Uh, I asked him to walk on the, on the line, right? Now you notice, you see right away, even before he started to walk, look at his, his right hand is kind of out compared to his left. So he's 20, 20 in both eyes, but watch him walk. Well, wa watch what happens. Now listen to what he says. I'm going to ask him to describe his vision and listen to how he describes it. Now, see where he was pointing his hands? He's pointing his hands to his periphery. Now, remember, he's 20-20 in both eyes. And by the way, he's nowhere near the line. He's drifted completely off. Um, we take a prism, and a prism is a specific type of ophthalmic lens that when I put it on, it's not a regular pair of glasses, but it can make the floor look tilted to somebody. So I can take one of my staff and mess with them. <laughs> I can make the floor look tilted this way or this way. And what you'll often find is when you tilt the floor, the patient will actually adjust their gaze to make it look flat, right? 
So we kind of take that concept and we use it the other way around. I'm like, oh, if we can mess up people who aren't injured, why can't I use the prism the other way around to help people that are injured? So here's the patient, same day, wearing the prism within about a half an hour. Slowly and try to stay on the line. You said what, you're about 6'4"? Too quick, but turn around and walk. Now he's going to walk towards the end. And he, what's really cool is he actually does this spontaneously. I was going to turn off the camera, but he wants to say, no, no, keep, keep recording. I want to try something. So he could never turn his head from side to side without losing his balance or grounding and he would fall. So if you look at him at the original clip on your left, you'll notice his upper body is very static, right? He dare not move his head. Now watch what happens here. So you see, you can turn his head and no, no, no problem whatsoever. So if I, if I turn off the sound here, let's go back. I'm going to turn off the sound on both clips. And what I'm going to do is just ask you and try to, stay on the line. to look at the video. This is the same patient on the same day. The only thing we changed was how he was perceiving his periphery. So this is a part of vision that we are majorly missing here. So, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. This is another case that we saw from a kid. This actually hit the news for CTV. So it's always nice when the media picks up on it. Seeing clearly may require more than 2020 vision. A Guelph based optometrist says eye teaming problems may not be captured during a regular eye exam and can cause issues similar to learning and attention disorders. They can also be a complication of a concussion. CTV's Krista Simpson explains. This is Hanya Kwiatkowski, post concussion, needing her mother's help to walk in the optometrist's office. I felt like really dizzy and kind of confused, like all the time. And everything was kind of fuzzy. But then she tries on a pair of glasses with yoked prisms that make the floor seem less slanted. It was a really big difference. It was like I couldn't walk at all. And then I put the glasses on and was like, okay, I can walk now. <laughs> Those glasses helping address her issues with eye teaming or how the two eyes work together. It's a problem that can also be behind reading difficulties, says Dr. Patrick Quaid. Because I have to, I have to converge my eyes in order to be able to, to, to read and track from side to side. So if you, if you think of if you're driving a car and the wheels are out of alignment, it's a lot more difficult to control the vehicle. Well, the same thing kind of goes if both eyes are not teaming together on the page. So it was kind of nice to get a shout out from the media. They don't often get it right, but they got it bang on in that case. Um, taking a step back, one thing we try to do with uh, concussion patients when we bring them into the clinic, we try to figure out where the primary problem is because not they're not always visual. So we, we are very careful to stay in our lane. And questionnaires like this one where you can do, uh, you, you kind of score each box from, from zero to six, excuse me. And um, there's six columns, vision, vestibular, migraine, cognitive, cervical, or neck, and anxiety. And, and depending on which column gets the highest score, that's typically where we try to start the intervention by either treating if it's a vision issue or getting somebody else involved that we work with for another aspect. So that interdisciplinary care is a really, really important piece. You can drill further down into the visual symptoms. There's other questionnaires where you can um, get scores, but go further into the visual symptomatology. So often it's good to get these scores and they're subjective symptoms, but I think it's important. Patients come to us because they have symptoms, right? So it's important that we quantify those because however we decide to treat them, those symptom scores should be improving over time. And we need to show that. Um, other research papers that, that are out there um, that actually talk about um, uh, the evidence in the peer reviewed journals for uh, treating visual problems in post-concussion patients. Um, there's a lot of papers out there, so I just put those in there for you. This is also the uh, updated clinical practice guidelines. So this was actually published from McMaster. And if you actually, this is published in Brain Injury, and there's newer versions available, but what, what I like about this one 
was they actually highlighted specifically on the bottom there uh, under persistent visual dysfunction. They basically said other functional vision changes should be given consideration to, uh, for referral to a qualified optometrist specializing in neurooptometric rehabilitation for vision therapy. So it's right in their own guidelines. So, you know, going, going beyond the regular eye exam in, in this subset of patients is really, really important. Um, there's actually papers that have shown changes in visual function using fMRI. So we can use imaging to show that there's a change with the therapy. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there that the therapy is at least useful. Um, I don't think we have a level one evidence trial just yet, but I think we're working on it, but it's definitely high enough that it, uh, we should be considering this for patients who have persistent visual symptoms. Um, so a big reason, this is one, one topic um, that, that is actually very close to me. So in Ireland, I don't know if you know or not, but there's, there's an epidemic of suicide in Ireland. Um, there's a very, Ireland actually has, where I was born, has the highest uh, suicide rate of, of patients under 30 of all developed nations, right? That's not a proud stat that I am proud to say as an Irishman. Um, Ireland is known for sports like rugby, um, Gaelic football, uh, hurling, which are all very high impact sports. I mean, here I know we have similar sports like ho hockey and things like that, but Ireland um, hurling, for example, is often done with no protective gear whatsoever. So, so when you look at these types of sports, um, you start to look into concussion and, you know, concussion patients, post-concussion syndrome patients have a three times higher rate of suicide compared to the general population. Um, and that, that's a statistic that I think we need to pay attention to because when people think we're handling this area well, we're not. Um, the other really depressing stat is that over half of the patients, and by the way, the sample side of, uh, size of this paper, which, is, uh, which was published by the Canadian Medical Association Journal, shows that um, they had a sample size of 235,000, right? And they showed out of the patients who tra tragically committed suicide from that population group, which I think was 667 patients, um, over half of those patients had had a documented visit with their physician in the last week of life. So that tells us, okay, these folks are looking for help. They're not getting it. Um, and I think we need to be clear about that. And there's the graph from Ireland. And what's really interesting is, and let me be clear, every suicide is a tragedy, but there's a, uh, there's a four to one ratio of male to females for suicides. And I think that that is also not being spoken about um, in terms of, of, you know, males tend to be, um, they tend to have smaller so social circles. Uh, we tend to be more, um, let's just say females are the, are the dominant species from a communication standpoint. Uh, I can, most males can name their really close friends on one hand. Right. And I think that's just a, a side effect of, of society or whatever it is, but it means that the, the social net for males is potentially not as good. So I think, I think we need to keep that in mind from a mental health standpoint. Um, the thing that really annoys me is, you know, when people say there's not much you can do in concussion, that really, really annoys me. And I, and I, and I will just say wrong, wrong, wrong. So sorry, absolutely wrong. Um, this is a wonderful poem, or, or sorry, not, not a poem. This is a speech written by Theodore Roosevelt, who was one of the presidents of the U.S., and I think he was in around the time of the Second World War. And the man in the arena has got to be one of my favorite speeches. Um, and you can substitute the woman in the arena, whatever you want. But what I like about this poem, which I'll, I'll let people read in their own time, you can Google the man in the arena, Theodore Roosevelt on, on Google, and, and read his speech. It's very short. It's right there. Read his speech from start to finish. What he's basically saying is, it's very easy to criticize other people who are getting blood on their nose in the arena. If you're standing in the stands, it's very easy to critique. Um, and over the years, I've, I've come to the conclusion, thinking is hard. That's why most people critique, because <laughs> th thinking is hard. Um, and what we've done over the years with our clinic is we've actually tracked data in our clinic so this data right here uh, is actually showing, I'm not going to go into detail what the scores are, but they're, they're symptom check, they're symptom scores, right? And basically down is good. It means they're getting better. So these are um, over sample, samples of data from patients that we see in our clinic, and the sample size is over 120. Um, and this is their symptom scores at baseline and at each checkpoint in therapy as we're treating the patient. And what you can see is the symptom scores are clearly coming down. So their symptoms are getting better, right? And there's different questionnaires that you, you can use for that. But basically all the questionnaires that we have show an improvement. Then you look at reading efficiency. So up is good on this graph. Reading efficiency in both populations, in the pediatric population and the adult is getting better at each checkpoint, right? So, huh, so symptoms are getting better. Function is getting better. And what this one shows here is visual memory. Most of my concussion patients will say, my short-term memory 
sucks, quite frankly. Um, not long-term memory, short, short-term. So what this is showing is uh, using vi visual processing scores, are these patients getting improved visual memory scores as they go through vision therapy? And you can clearly see in both populations, there's a significant effect in the adults by the second checkpoint and the kids, you even see a significant effect by the first checkpoint. So this notion that you can't do anything about it now, having said that, you have to be upfront and say, there's two truths in concussion. The first is there's usually a lot you can do. So you might be able to get the patient from a two out of 10 to an eight out of 10. You might get them to 10, but you can probably get them a lot better than two. So the first truth is there's a lot you can do. The second truth, which you also have to be upfront about is life is never the same after a concussion. Um, even though I dealt with my injuries when I was you know, nine, even to this day, I think the only hole left in my gas tank is sound. So you notice now I have earphones on. Background noise drives me nuts. If I'm doing a lecture or there's a fan on in the background or something like that, it really drives me nuts. So background noise is my Achilles heel. But my visual stuff is taken care of. My neck is good. My sleep is good. So a lot of the other holes in my gas tank have been solved. So do I think I'm doing okay? Yeah. But I think there's, there's a truth there that also has to be communicated to people to say, you want to get that patient to what I call MRP, maximum rehabilitative potential. You might be able to get them out of 10. You might be able to get them to 10, but get them as close to 10 as you can. Um, let me just skip, skip by that for a second. Uh, this is the, the medical textbook that myself and Dr. Singman from John. So Eric is, um, he's an MD PhD. I'm an optometry PhD. So he's the uh, chief of neuro-ophthalmology at Johns ha Hopkins. So he's, he's a pretty big fish in his pond. And him and I got together and wrote a, a, a medical book chapter in this textbook. And there's about 250 references to peer reviewed journals. So, you know, when people say there's no evidence behind visual rehabilitation for concussion, I honestly have to laugh out loud and say, you know, I'm sorry, if we get the head of Johns Hopkins, you've got two PhDs here uh, who've co authored a medical book chapter with nearly 250 references to peer reviewed journals. I think the argument of not paying attention to this is pretty much gone. Um, this is actually a letter personally from Dr. Singman. This is actually addressed to our regulatory board. Um, basically saying to our, to the College of Optometrists that we need to be paying more attention to this area as a profession. So that's quite a strong letter penned from one doctor to another doctor's board, right? Uh, and what Eric says in the letter, he says, however, vision problems after brain injury present in ways that are often far more subtle compared to routine eye exams. Usually patients have normal ophthalmic exams, so the regular eye exam is normal. The clinician treating these patients must spend sufficient time exploring the patient's history and symptoms and then test appropriately to find the issues such as reduced accommodation, virgins facility, pursuits, and tracking. So he's basically saying you have to talk to the patient more and really look at the history and you have to do more, more specific testing over and above a routine eye exam, which I completely agree with. So yeah, so why is visual rehabilitation not being discussed more in concussion circles? That's a very good question. Um, this is actually uh, kind of a reality check, actually. I put this in kind of as a, as a, as a lighthearted slide. Um, when people talk about proof in healthcare, you know, medical evidence and trials and all this stuff, what's really interesting is when you look at the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, this is actually published in 2020, they came to the conclusion that only one in 10 mainstream medical treatments, so these are medical treatments that are routinely accepted in society, uh, only one in 10 is actually backed by high quality peer reviewed papers. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't do them, but we don't have a level one trial for everything. And as an aside to do a level one trial, which is a double blind placebo controlled multi-centered uh, trial, um, it costs about a million bucks per trial. So they're not cheap to do. So of course, there's not a lot of them out there. Um, but I always tell people, you know, you don't need to you don't need to build a spaceship to cross the road. Sometimes things are obvious. You know, if somebody's eyes aren't teaming together properly and half of my brain is for visual machinery and I have a concussion, is it really rocket science that my eyes stop teaming together? Probably not, right? Um, and I think that's that um, proof here is, or that statement here, I mean, one of the best statements that was made to me during my PhD, which I really enjoyed because, you know, yes, you're, uh, you're poor during your PhD, you're a grad student. Um, but you really have space to think. And it's probably the only time in my life where I've actually had three or four years to really think. And my PhD supervisor at the time, John Flanagan, who's now the Dean of Optometry out in Berkeley, said, Patrick, remember, the mind is like a parachute. It's only of use when open. And that's a very appropriate phrase from an academic standpoint. So somebody, I, I promised I'd touch on this in the lecture. So I literally added this slide while I was jumping on the, 
on the call. So we're actually working on a, a, a device that we're hoping is going to be objective. And what I mean by objective is irrefutable. So how many, I've lost count how many concussion patients I've come across who've, you know, gone for uh, uh, an eye exam, been told there's nothing wrong with them. Then they go for an IME assessment, or maybe they find a neurooptometrist who does a good job and says, yep, there, there's a problem. Uh, then they go to the insurance company and the insurance company doesn't send them to an optometrist, sends them to an ophthalmologist, which who are perfectly good professionals. They're surgeons and they're very good at what they do, but they're not really rehab docs. So those docs don't really look at the function too much. And they'll say, well, you know, you have two eyes and your retina looks good and you see 2020. So there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Um, well, the bottom line is, um, you know, we, we have to be clear about what we mean by vision. So what this device does, when you look through it, it actually measures how quickly your pupils respond. Because what's something that we see in a lot of concussion patients? Light sensitivity. Well, why are they light sensitive? Um, what we found is patients who've had concussions, when you shine a light in their eye, what should happen is the pupil should constrict and then stay constricted. What we see in concussion patients is the pupil constricts, not as much as it should. And then after a very short time period, even though you have the light still shining in the eye, the pupil starts to redilate. We call it rebound dilation. So that is actually a, um, an objective biomarker. Because at the end of the day, you can't fake a pupil reflex, right? So that's actually a pretty valuable diagnostic technique. So we've been working on this for a number of years. And it's, it's as I said, it, we're, we're hopefully very close to uh, patents and FDA approval and all that fun stuff. It's been a long process so far, but we're still continuing with it. So that's, that's what's coming down the pipeline. Um, so there's our clinic. If you need our website, it's viewtherapy.ca. There's three board certified doctors. I'm not the only one. There's three, and they're all very good. Dr. Rutten and Dr. Cunningham and myself. And View Cubed, the, the E cube stands for Educate, Enhance, and Empower, because our goal is to empower people and unlock human potential because these types of injuries really do inhibit people. So when I go back to that quote from Yates that says, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. What I really mean by that is education is useless without application. Uh, and this is, and I'm not directing this comment to people on this talk, but I'll often say to my colleagues, what are you doing for society? As a doctor, what are you contributing? What, what problem are you fixing for people? So our vision statement is empowering people, unlocking human potential. And so in order to help our patients, we have to ask the right questions. And I think that's where it starts. So rather than saying, you know, how are you seeing? What we should be saying is, how are you handling grocery stores and malls? How are you handling stairs, going upstairs and downstairs? How are you handling scrolling on a computer screen? We have to ask the right questions because it's all about motion and eye movements. Um, some books, I've actually talked to Claire. Uh, I've got seven copies of this book uh, from Dr. Comer. So that's the book on the left. So Dr. Comer has actually done, he's written a really, really good book um, called A New Hope in, uh, for Concussion and TBI and PTSD. Uh, there's other stuff that I've published. And we have a chapter in Dr. Comer's book, but I really love, love his book because uh, he's a, an MD out in Burlington. He does a lot of work in hormone dysfunction post-concussion. And his whole area could be a lecture by itself. In fact, you should probably have him on here at some point. Um, but our chapter's in there. There's a chapter in there written by the Green Beret Foundation. Uh, it, it's a really good book. So I'll, I'll drop off seven copies of those to Claire and we'll figure out how to get them. And it'll probably be like first come, first serve. Um, but it's also on Amazon. It's not that expensive. I think it's like 10, 15 bucks. Um, also, vi vision therapy services are actually not unusual now. We're actually seeing them in the States a lot. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital does vision therapy for kids there. So it's not something that's typically OHIP covered, um, but it is something that you can potentially, certainly if it's an MVA related accident from a, from a car accident, um, most of the OCF and the HKI folks, we have a north of 90% approval rate for therapy. So there are ways to get it covered from a VT standpoint. Um, I put the posters in here if anybody wants to look at the research. We're not, obviously not going to go through those, but if anyone wants to do a deep dive on the detail, I'll make sure I send clear the slides so you can lo look at this afterwards. And I think I'll, I'll stop there and I will pass the, uh, pass the podium back to Claire. Great. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I'm just going to stop the recording and we can go on to uh, questions and answers.